Chapter 1 Ass Kickings and Eggplants As my friend Dimebag used to say, Let's go! I was born on July 9, 1965, in the Bronx in New York. My mother, Rose, is a strong woman. She had to be. She had five kids. I was the oldest, and then my siblings, Suzanne, Tony Ann, Charles, and Anthony followed. Even with so many of us, Mom was always there for me, any time I needed her. God bless her. My dad was an oil burner mechanic, and his job was to go to different places and fix them. Now I look back at that time of my life, I know that he had a good heart and that he was very generous because whatever he had, he would give it to you. At the same time, I'm pretty sure I have a hot temper thanks to the things I witnessed when I was young. Where his anger came from, I don't know. But even when I was young, I knew that was how I didn't want to be. To this day, if people tell me I have a temper, it hits home because I don't want to be like him. We had a nice three-bedroom house of around 1,500 square feet in a beautiful neighborhood in Rockland County where there was a good school system. That sounds great, right? Well, it was, but it all changed when I was around 10 years old because my dad left. Even before he left, I knew things weren't right between him and my mom. I clearly remember the pain of watching them fight. I don't even want to think about some of the arguments that they had. It was really ugly, and it remains embedded in my brain more than 45 years later. Like Gene said in his forward, some wounds never heal. Well, he's right about that. My poor mom was left with no money, which makes me really angry even now. She didn't work because she was a housewife looking after a big family. Back in the day, a woman was the wife and looked after the kids, and the man went out and was the breadwinner. But he left her with nothing, so what could she do? I remember her calling his office and everybody there covering for him, saying, Oh, he hasn't been here today. But my mom knew the truth, and that broke my heart. I knew it, too. I didn't want to think it, but I knew it. We continued to live in the old house for a little while, but repossession notices were starting to come in because we had no income and the mortgage wasn't being paid. There was very little food, and I remember one time seeing my mom standing at the stove crying. This memory fucks me up to this day. She was making rice aroni as a meal. It was the last food in the house, and she was worried that there wasn't going to be enough for all five kids. Of course, it was never going to be enough for all of us. I can talk about this now because I've had therapy, and I want people to understand, but it still hurts. What I can understand, and I've asked my dad this question, and he didn't have an answer for me, was how you can leave a family of five with no money. Especially when one of them, my brother Anthony, was still a baby. How does any human being leave a family like that? I have no answer to that question either, because I can't imagine ever doing it myself. My mom was strong, though, and she kept us together, even through her own horrible pain. She got a job, and she got a driver's license so she could drive us around. Thank God for her strength. When we lost the house, we moved to a low-income apartment in Havistraw, which was not the best of neighborhoods. I went to a public school there, and as if the family of being abandoned with no money and having to move out of our house wasn't enough, now my problems got even worse, because I got beat up every day on the way to school. I mean this literally, every single day. I got my ass kicked by bigger guys than me. I don't know why. I guess there were some neighborhood bullies who enjoyed beating up kids smaller than them. I remember there was this one specific guy that got me every day with his buddy to help him. I had to take this one path to school, and this dude waited on that path with his friend. He'd look for ways to start with me. I tried to keep walking past him, but he'd come right up in front of me and stop me so I couldn't get away. And then he'd start punching me. I don't know why he didn't like me. I didn't exactly have the time to ask him. He was too busy hitting me. This motherfucker was huge. And I was just a little kid, so I had no chance. I remember this clearly because it scarred me mentally. 
and later went to therapy for this. I could only get away from his abuse by hiding under nearby cars. I'm not kidding. I'd stay under the fucking car until he would leave, and then I would go to school. I remember this prick's name to this day. And while we were writing this book, my co-writer Joel found him on Facebook. I haven't looked him up myself, though, and obviously, I'm not going to name him here. Anyway, I always say the bullying built character, just to laugh about it. Laughter is a big deal in my life. People say I'm a funny guy, and I'm glad to hear that. But ask any comedian in the world where their comedy comes from, and they'll tell you it comes from a lot of pain. Joking aside, the bullying I received from this kid was genuinely terrible. And if I even smell bullying these days, I deal with it very quickly. I'm no tough guy, but I'm the prick that you really don't want to deal with in that situation. With all the therapy I've been through, my anger at being bullied is still there, although I suppress it. Like I said, that anger is never leaving me. I don't like it because it's a constant battle. So here I was, getting beat up every single day. I couldn't believe this bullshit. My life had been going so good. And then we lost the house, and now I'm getting my ass kicked. I thought, what the fuck is going on? After a few months of this, I was starting to wonder how my mental health would get through it, let alone the physical side. The daily beatings were getting worse. These were really violent attacks, and I couldn't do anything about it. I even learned karate and tried out all those moves. But you can't win a fight when there are two guys, both bigger than you, beating you up. Mentally, I wasn't the same person anymore because the insecurity was building up in me, which turned into anger. I was so angry about being insecure. I knew I was either going to die or run away. There was only one solution in that situation. I had to move out and go to a different school. So, when I was 11, I moved in with my grandmother in the Bronx. I left my mom with the four younger kids, which was a great source of guilt to me because I was her oldest son, even though I did it out of necessity. Fortunately, my mom thought it was the obvious thing to do. She could see that I was freaking the fuck out. I honestly felt that I had to move away from Haverstraw to survive. I give my mother a lot of credit for that, because that was a hard choice, to let your son live with someone else. My grandmother was Bernadette Benanti, although we all called her Tina. Her house at Graff Avenue in the Bronx immediately felt like home. Actually, it had always felt like home. I remember going over to Tina's house because it was always such a warm, welcoming place. It really meant a lot to me. It was, no pun intended, my safe home, because it was where I always felt secure. When I moved in, I felt as if a huge weight had lifted from me. Tina's son, Charlie Benanti, was my uncle, although he was only three years older than me. Tina had had him relatively late in life. Charlie had four sisters, the oldest being my mom, Rose. The others were my Aunt Angela, my Aunt Susan, and my Aunt Lori. The only one who lived there when I lived there was Lori. She was closer to my age, so she was more like a big sister to me than an aunt. Charlie's dad, my grandfather Charles, was full Italian, and he passed in 1966, when Charlie was four years old. I always felt bad for Charlie because he lost his father when he was so young. I remember sitting on my grandfather's lap at the kitchen table and playing games with him while he sang to me. I love that memory. I wish I had more time with him because I think I could have learned a lot from him about life, as my father was no use to me. Charlie was like a big brother to me. I'm very grateful to him for letting me come and live in his house when we were kids, including me as an everyday family member. That's not easy to do, but we were always close, maybe because we were so similar in age. This was a very loving environment. Tina should have been Saint Tina. I hold her in that much regard. She was the best person on earth. I have great memories of her talking to me about the right and wrong things in life. Whatever you believe spiritually, I believe that my grandmother was put on earth to be an angel to me and my family. I still feel like that today. The three most important women in my life have been my wife, Teresa, my mother, Rose, and my grandmother, Tina. My Aunt Lori was also a big part of my life, as was her sister, Susan. 
I have great love for all these women who shaped me to be the man I am. They were always there for me. I believe that strong women are not appreciated enough in our society. I would love to see a female president. I really would, because we would all benefit. In America, it's so male-driven. Everybody likes to fight. We men think we have to be dominant and masculine, and I hate that. That's why so many people in this world are the way they are. Women have a better sense of what people are. There's something about that perspective that I really appreciate. It's nurturing, regardless of whether they're hard women or soft women. I love them all because they have something somewhere in their hearts that makes them care. Talking of nurturing, let me talk a minute about the food my grandmother made. To this day, I'm a sucker for great food. I was very lucky to grow up in a house with the best cook in the world. I remember getting ready for the great family meals we had every Sunday, hoping Tina would make the peppers and eggs, or the gravy with sausages and meatballs, or ravioli, or eggplant parmesan. Oh my God, the eggplant parmesan. She used to do it the right way, where she used to skin the eggplant. Some people are allergic to the skin, and it makes their lips itch if they eat it. I'm one of those, and I love eggplant. So whenever I eat it in a restaurant, I'm scratching my lips all the time. When I ate it at my grandmother's, though, it was never like that. She cooked the best of the best, and it was always made with love. Imagine the typical Italian grandmother. That's who Tina was. She cared about everything. It was my saving grace for life. That house, that block, that neighborhood, those people. Things would have gone a different way for me if I didn't have that security and support. Because the people in the neighborhood was so great, I was friends with all the kids who lived nearby. My new school was great too. It was PS72, and I was at that school for fifth grade. On my first day, I was still very insecure, affected by what I had been through. I didn't know if there would be bullies at this school too, but thankfully, I met a bunch of good people, and things really took off from there. I did get jumped once when I was in sixth or seventh grade. By then, I was at IS-192 in the Bronx, or Piagentini Jones Intermediate School, to give it its full name. That was a horrible day. I was going to school like I did every day, taking the local MTA bus and getting off outside my school. I don't know why, but three kids attacked me. One kid jumped on my back while another was swinging at me, and the third one was kicking me from the side. I still remember that the kid on my back held back my arms, and while he was doing that, he actually started to bite my back. I could feel the cut on my back from the biting, so all three of them were really giving me a beating. Thankfully, I was good at taking care of myself, so I flipped the first guy off my back. I know it sounds like a fight in a movie, but I swear this is true. And then I ran into the school. I limped to the principal's office and told him I got jumped. It became this big thing because the principal sent me home. My aunt Laurie saw me and freaked out. Went to the school and made a huge stink about it. You see what I mean about being a strong woman? She got the job done when usually you would have gone to your dad to get it taken care of. Laurie took charge because there was no dad. The absence of a father is why, while I'm alive, I will never let my son be without. Never. I probably spoil him too much. As fathers like me do, but I'm in every nook and cranny of his life because I was raised by strong women, and that's the truth. This is a short life that we have, and if I can help anybody that went through anything similar to what I did, that's my goal. There's so much in the word that can help you to get through to the next day. I knew about depression and being scared and being insecure in school growing up. And getting my ass kicked because I didn't have the backbone from a father who should have taught me to have one. I want you, the listener, to know that it's possible to survive this. If you have a strong parent or someone supportive in your life, and hopefully you have at least one of those, you can do it. That's the truth. Abandonment is a big deal to me. There's so much of that around today. Whatever kind of person you are, abandonment has everything to do with how you grow as a person. I thank God for my family. Without them, I think I would have been in jail or dead. Back to the Bronx. Here I was, living in a safe home, enjoying a pretty normal life, except for rare incidents like the one I just mentioned. 
I was a sports guy outside of school and played a lot of baseball. My Uncle Joe, who was married to my Aunt Sue, ran a deli on Harding Avenue. And around 1980, when I was 15, gave me a job there for $2 an hour. It was around the block from my grandmother's house, so I used to walk there after school and work there from 3.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. So now I was a deli guy, a cashier, and I used to cut meat. I was still working at Joe's Deli when Anthrax's first record came out four years later. I would come off tour where we got $5 a day per diem and go right back into the deli to make money to live. I'm still an amazing meat cutter to this day. I can make a sandwich like nobody. I totally enjoyed it because I'm a people person and I got to know the customers. The store was in a good area, but there were some scary times. Joe got robbed a couple of times at gunpoint, but luckily for me, I wasn't there when that happened. My Uncle Joe has always been a father figure to me. He really took me under his wing and I learned a lot of life lessons from him. He taught me the rights and wrongs because once again, I had no direction from any other man. This time was definitely my growing up as a man. I learned a lot at that deli. Uncle Joe was only about 10 years older than me, so I could relate to him easily. Of course, I had lots of strong women in my life, but it was important to have a man to look up to. Any fatherly advice I had when I was young came from Joe. Joe couldn't understand how any guy could leave his kids because he's a good father who takes care of his loved ones. He saw what we went through when my mother was left alone with five kids and moved over to my grandmother's house, and he cared deeply about us. He and my Aunt Sue would ask me, because they were always concerned about my future, where are you putting the money you're making in the deli? Not that it was a lot of money, but it was the only money I had. So I would give them whatever cash I didn't need for records and whatever, and they would keep it in an envelope for me, because I didn't have a bank account. Joe really showed me the importance of saving a dollar. I can't credit him enough for how much I learned at his store. I remember Joe showing me the right way to work the cash register and to give the right change because you need to be able to count money correctly in this life. He showed me how to use the meat cutter safely too, putting the guard on so I didn't injure myself. Other things I learned were important too. For example, I'd be stocking shelves, so I'd walk over to a box of food cans, label one, and then walk back to the shelf and put the can on it. Joe would say, Take the box over to the shelf and save yourself a trip each time. These lessons teach you how to make things easier for yourself, and those lessons have served me well throughout my life. Life is going to be hard work whatever you do, so let's learn ways to make it easier for ourselves. Joe gave me some good advice about relationships, too. When I talked to him about a girl who came into the deli that I wanted to date, he'd say, be careful with that one, and make sure you put a rubber on your hammer. This wasn't just work advice, these were serious life lessons for a teenager. When I wasn't working, there was nothing better than hanging out with my family in my grandmother's house, or with my friends from the neighborhood, just having dinner on a Sunday afternoon, or at birthday parties. Man, I remember some great times. Our neighbors would come over and play cards with my aunts in the evenings. They used to call me a yenta, which is a Yiddish word meaning gossip because I'd sit in the corner and listen to all their life stories. They'd talk about who they hated and who this one bastard was and who this other schmuck was and all this great gossip, and they'd be drinking tons of coffee and smoking up a storm. There was never any harm in all this gossip, though, and I loved to listen to it because they were true life stories. i think, wow, that happens? And take it in, like a fly on the wall. I remember one guy had serious flatulence, which was hilarious to me. At any given time, the woman would suddenly scream, Did you fart? I loved it. Those were great days. And at Christmas? Damn. I wish I could take you right there now, just for the food alone. It was like a Martin Scorsese film, but in real life. On Christmas Eve, everybody came to my grandmother's house, all parts of the family, because she was the matriarch. She was the love of the family. She kept everybody together through love, not discipline. You just wanted to be around her. Everybody, my mother, the in-laws, people's boyfriends and girlfriends, the neighbors, everybody was there. The atmosphere, full of love, was a draw for them, and the food was another one, a big one. 
There was everything, from the breaded shrimp she made to the three-colored cookies she baked because she was the best baker in the world. If you've never heard of three-colored Italian cookies, find them on the Internet immediately. Even so, the pictures you see are nowhere near what my grandma could do. Days before Christmas, she stopped preparing them. Everything was made from scratch. She'd be cooking nonstop for that one Christmas Eve. I'm telling you, she went from soup to nuts, from the snacks and the appetizers to the main meals and fish and pasta and meat, whatever anybody wanted, and cheesecakes and pies. Of course, everybody brought their own food over as well, and the wine was flowing. I'm telling you, it's a miracle. I didn't weigh 500 pounds when I was living there. And then imagine the presents. Nobody was rich because we were all very blue-collar people, but everybody made a decent living so we would all get gifts. We'd wait until midnight before opening the presents, apart from my mother, who couldn't wait that long and would start ripping them open at 11.30 p.m. That was even more fun. And then you ended the night with coffee and pastries and cake, so you didn't get out of there until 2 or 3 in the morning. You'd come down on Christmas Day, and you'd almost feel like you had a hangover without having drunk any booze. You practically be in a food coma, but you feel so fucking satisfied, not just because of the food, but because of the love and energy and the vibe in that house, which had such a glow on it. All this is God's honest truth spoken from my heart. I miss those days, because as you get older, families fragment and different segments have their own children. We all love each other, and we all see each other occasionally, but it's nowhere like those old days. I feel like the luckiest person on earth to have had those days, coming from where I came from. Those people were always so supportive to me, my siblings, and my mom, because they knew what we'd been through. That's what great families do.